Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another edition of AJAC Live Online. My name is Joel Burney, and it is a pleasure to have you with us this afternoon. A quick flip to our guest of honor today, Danielle, how are you? Lovely, thanks. It's great to see you again, and we're looking forward to uh, getting the knowns, hearing the knowns and unknowns of what's going on in the United States at the moment. Special mention to our Facebook audience, as well as our international guests. Thank you for joining with us today. Now, as usual, I do a very short housekeeping where I advertise our next webinars. We are lucky to announce two upcoming webinars in one. So firstly, our next guest will be former White House Deputy National Security Advisor, Elliot Abrams. Elliot will present to us on Tuesday, the 2nd of March. We also uh, have locked in our go-to Israel expert, Ehud Yari, to provide our audience with an update just before the upcoming Israeli election. Ehud's webinar will be on Wednesday, the 17th of March. Now, you don't have to write down those dates yet, ladies and gentlemen. An invitation will hit your inbox in the next couple of hours sometime later today, and you can register for both or either or, uh, but you'll have that invitation soon enough. Now, as usual, ladies and gentlemen, we will be conducting a moderated question and answer session during today's webinar. When we get to that stage, I'll go through the ways of being able to raise your hand to ask Danielle a question yourself. Now for our main event, she requires very little introduction as she's a close friend of AJAC. Danielle Pletka is a senior fellow in foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. And currently she's a professor and she teaches US Middle East policy at Georgetown University's Watts School of Foreign Service. And before joining AEI, she was a senior professional staff member for the Middle East and South Asia for the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Ladies and gentlemen, today's topic is Biden, the Middle East and beyond, knowns and unknowns. I would now like to hand over to Ajax, Dr. Colin Rubenstein to say a few words. Thanks very much, Joel. And of course, uh, I agree, it's a great pleasure to host Danielle Flecker again today. After a great session she gave to us last year on the forthcoming US presidential election then. And today we want our insights going forward on the Biden presidency, the knowns and unknowns. Now, uh, Danielle brings amazing Washington insider experience and very impressive think tank knowledge and smarts to the table on this crucial topic. Uh, from an Australian perspective, we have to say that uh, going forward, uh, there's clearly uh, continued friendship uh, between uh, the US and Australia, no daylight. Uh, President Biden has uh, made that phone call uh, to our Prime Minister, Scott uh, Morrison, and there is a commitment to engage with allies in the broad Asia Pacific region and an undoubted sort of uh, backbone and realism about the realities uh, of, the, of China's challenge uh, to this whole region, to Australia, the region, and indeed globally. However, uh, today we're focusing on the Middle East and uh, what's the Biden effect there? And uh, I think it's fair to say that it's still blowing in the wind, so to speak. The jury's out. There's no doubt that the Biden administration looks like it'll be tougher on Turkey. It'll be tougher on Saudi Arabia. Um, with whatever effect there, good and bad. Uh, it's certainly opening up to the Palestinians with renewed contacts and aid, some would say maybe prematurely. Uh, but so far as Israel goes, there are mixed signals. Uh, there is support, uh, wholehearted support for the Abraham Accords, leaving uh, the embassy in Jerusalem, uh, but some doubts uh, on the Golan about uh, the legality uh, of Israel's uh, claim to sovereignty. Going back to the UNHRC, uh, refunding UNRWA, um, and questions being raised as to whether some daylight's being inserted in the, in the relationship, despite the history of a very strong support and warmth uh, from Joe Biden uh, towards Israel. But the biggie, of course, not just for Israel, but uh, for its Middle East uh, friends and allies, uh, the Saudis, the Gulf states, Egypt, Jordan, and so on, uh, is, of course, the Iran issue and the declared intent of the Biden administration to go back into the JCPOA, uh, subject, of course, as Secretary of State uh, uh, Blinken puts it, uh, providing there's compliance for compliance, that Iran complies first and then the US will comply. But uh, as Danielle Plitka knows better than anyone else, uh, personnel can be politics. 
and she knows all the new personnel coming back into the Biden administration. So many of them are from the Obama aid team on Iran, Mali, Sherman, Burns, etc. These are not just names to Daniel. She knows them all very, very well, certainly from her experience in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the think tank world. So that's why we want her insights today as to how all this will play out. The, the, these questions and so many others that frankly, very few are better qualified to comment on than Danielle Pletka, to whom I gladly now hand over the screen. Danielle. Oh, Colin, thank you very much. You know, it's always so lovely to get a warm welcome from lovely and warm Australia. And Joel, thank you as well. Thank you to all of you for having me back. It's really, uh, it's one of the things that I enjoy most is to, to talk to Ajak. You guys do such fantastic work. It's really a, a pleasure to be, to be any part of it. So you asked me what we in Washington call a softball, you know, knowns and unknowns of the Biden administration in uh, in the Middle East, and and we're less than a month into the Biden administration, so pretty much everything is ahead. Uh, that leaves a pleasantly open field for us to speculate because there aren't a lot of facts we can work on. Although Colin, you you pulled a couple of those threads, and uh, and I'll talk a little bit about them. You know, obviously. The topic A on everybody's minds when you talk about the United States in the Middle East in the Biden administration is the question of Iran. And there I, I, I will confess to you that I'm perhaps a little bit more worried than uh, I am on some other questions. Why? So first of all, President Biden was, was asked uh, and, and as have been other members of his administration, whether he was really going to be the third Obama term. And he was pretty adamant and, you know, come on, man, you know my record. You know, he wants everybody to think that that the man who we knew, not as vice president in the Obama administration, but as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee over many decades, is in fact going to be the guy in the White House. Unfortunately, you know, personnel, as you rightly said, is, is policy. And a lot of the people who are familiar faces to those of us who care a great deal about Middle East um, are, uh, are the same faces that there were in the Obama administration. There is, I'm, I'm happy to see John Kerry relegated to, to a different position in the White House. And I'm really hoping that he's going to keep his business to himself because he was such a pernicious actor then. But of course, Wendy Sherman has been nominated to be the Deputy Secretary of State in this administration. She was one of the key people who negotiated the, the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which we all know fondly as the Iran deal. Wendy, um, I've known from many decades, I hesitate to say. I can say that about everybody now. Uh, and and um, and she's not a Middle East expert. She's not an Iran expert. She's not a negotiations expert. She's not a proliferation expert. But she is a known quantity of the Iranians, and they like her. They like her a lot. Uh, Tony Blinken, who is confirmed and is the Secretary of State, is somebody who a lot of us are very fond of. I've known him since he was working for Senator Biden and I was at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, Tony's a good guy. You're not going to find somebody in Washington who says anything different. Good guy and a gentleman. The issue is he was also the same guy who was the National Security Advisor to now President Biden when he was Vice President. In other words, the person who oversaw a lot of the decisions from the perspective of the vice president and didn't stand in the way of the progress of this really, really, really terrible JCPOA. We've got Bill Burns, who's now been nominated to be the head of the Central Intelligence Agency. He was until two months ago, my next door neighbor as the president of the Carnegie Endowment, another figure who was engaged in this, in this business and not to anybody's good. But the person who's gotten the most attention is a fellow named Rob Malley. Rob, another old friend and a person who I like a great deal. Uh, my colleague, Michael Rubin, wrote a piece about him that I really appreciated because it really separated out the personality politics that have become the bane of our existence here in Washington, DC. Everybody's a rotten human being. Everybody deserves some comment about their personality. And, uh, and, and Michael said, Michael wrote a piece and he said, you're not gonna meet a person in Washington, DC who will say that Rob Malley is not a great guy. He's a very, very nice person, warm hearted. When I, when I 
uh, brought together a group of people in order to protest the Iranian government's targeting of uh, Mark Dubowitz, who I'm sure is a name familiar to all of you, who is uh, one of the leaders of the Foundation for Defense of Democracy, which has been working assiduously on the question of Iran sanctions. And was he was retaliated against by the government of Iran. I couldn't find a Democrat who would stand with me in order to denounce this. And Rob Malley stood up and did it with me and brought along all sorts of people from our community. That's the kind of good guy he is. The problem is that his views on the Middle East are what we would say are call out of the mainstream. And that includes obviously his willingness to include, to regard Hamas as a, as a legitimate political group, as a group with whom he met. His views on Israel are really not, uh, I would say, even the views of the mainstream of the Democratic Party. And his views on Iran are, let's just say, rather soft. And that is the area of concern for all of us. Now, uh, I'm talking a lot about people. And of course, the reason I'm talking about people is because we don't know what the administration is going to do. They've started out in some ways good news and in some ways bad news. Let's start with the bad news first so we can end on a high note. The, the bad news is that the administration, even before the inauguration of, um, of President Biden, was reportedly meeting with the Iranians in New York in order to try to lay a path towards the renewal of the, of the JCPOA. Now, those meetings took place. We don't know a lot about them, but we do know that the administration views this as one of their top priorities. What have they done? Well, last week, they removed the designation of the Iranian-backed um, Houthis in Yemen. They were designated as a terrorist organization in the waning days of the, uh, uh, of the Trump administration. They removed that designation. What happened? In the next two days, there were four armed drone attacks by the Houthis on civilian targets in Saudi Arabia. What did the, Trump, what, what did the Biden administration do? They condemned those but they're not rethinking their designation. What else has happened? We've seen that uh, a very dear and close friend of mine, uh, somebody who worked against Hezbollah in Lebanon was murdered um, by Hezbollah. He was found shot in his, his car in Lebanon. That's Lukman Slim. What has the administration done? Very little. Uh, yesterday, uh, at least yesterday our time, uh, on Monday, uh, there was a, an attack by Iranian proxies against uh, American and Iraqi targets in Erbil. Uh, an American serviceman was injured, an American contractor was killed. We know the Iranians are behind this. The Iranians are testing the Biden administration, and so far the Biden administration has shown itself to be reticent in pushing back. Now, what's the good news? The good news is that a lot, of a lot of people thought that the Biden administration would move immediately to lift sanctions that were imposed by the Trump administration, that they would signal to the Iranians that it was going to be open season for new money and that they were going to be asking very little of the Iranians in return. That has not happened. And the Iranians have pressed and pressed and the Biden administration has basically told them, you need to step back. If you are not going to return to the status quo ante before the United States left the JCPOA and return to compliance, then we are not going to come back in. I'm hoping, I'm worrying, but I'm hoping that they're gonna to stick to that line because I think it's very unlikely that the Iranians come back in. They have, an, they have an election this year. The Supreme Leader has said that they are no longer going to comply with these restrictions. They have been upping the ante. They are, uh, we don't need to go into the technicalities of how they're violating the JCPOA, but almost every day there is a new violation. And so, you know, bad news from Iran, but good news that the Biden administration is at least not as soft as we had worried about. Now, look, not everything is Iran. Uh, just very quickly, let's do a little rundown, but let's let's save most of our time for conversation because uh, that's the part that I enjoy the most. I really want to hear what you're thinking about. Look, what are we seeing that we're worried about? Um, the uh, the famous line from Barack Obama about um, uh, about Saudi Arabia and Iran. He told the Saudis, "You're just going to have to learn to share the region with Iran." Okay. Um, no, this is not the perspective that we want. We don't want either Saudi Arabia or Iran sharing the Middle East. 
the anti-Saudi bias on the part of this administration is going to be worrying. So far, we have arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab, Arab, Arab Emirates that have been put on hold, but that's pro forma. Let's see if they remain on hold. That'll be the real question. What kind of signals do they want to send? During the campaign, the Biden administration sent very hostile signals to the government of Saudi Arabia, many of which were richly deserved, we should add, but others which were taken by the Iranians and others as a sign that things were going to flip back to the Obama pro-Iran, seeing the Middle East through the prism of Tehran. Uh, and that, that is worrisome. Um, what else is going on? Syria. So there's apparently some talk about adding additional troops into Syria or re reversing the, the desire of the, of the Trump administration to go down to zero. Why do we care about that? Because ISIS is resurgent in Syria, because the Russians are causing trouble in Syria, and because Syria is Iran's most important partner in the region. The IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps that runs all of Iran's nefarious activities has been setting up chemical weapons, missile weapons, and possibly even nuclear in Syria. They use it as a backdoor for them to not comply with global uh, commitments and they are not being held to account. So any sign that the United States is gonna be more engaged there is very, very good news. Yemen, look, um, most people don't give a damn about Yemen, and one can understand why when one looks at the conflict that's going on. But if we understand the proxy war that's going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia, if we understand the threat to our interests with, from ISIS and Al Qaeda and Yemen, then what we see as the um, what we see the Biden administration doing is a net negative. How far will they go? How much will they tolerate? That's what we still don't know. And then, of course, there's our favorite topic of all. I, I laughed when Joel introduced and said, we're going to be talking about the Israeli elections. How many times have you said that in the last year, Joel? Um, <laughs> it's, it's true. Uh, and, and again, the fact that Joe Biden has not yet called Bibi Netanyahu is um, bad. And I don't want to put too fine a point on it. This is not about uh, the fact that Bibi Netanyahu threw his hat in with Donald Trump all too aggressively. It's not about the fact that the Israelis are perceived to be more sympathetic to the Republican Party. This is much more about the relationship between Israel and the United States. And that is a relationship that is meant to stand no matter who is in power, either in Jerusalem or in Washington. Now, good signs, not moving the embassy back from Jerusalem, good signs. We're not, uh, we're not repudiating some of the advances made under the Trump administration. The, the, we are not denigrating the Abraham Accords, which really were a fantastic accomplishment and a great step forward for the Middle East. But there's going to be a lot more pressure on Israel. And the fact that Biden is bowing to the most petty among his advisors who say he shouldn't talk to Bibi, I think is a, is a, is a bad sign. Getting back into UNRWA, as Colin said, absolutely ridiculous, an embarrassment. Getting back into the Human Rights Council, another embarrassment, and doing so without making any demands. One of the things I've written repeatedly is that, um, is that you know, like him, hate him, Donald Trump afforded his successor a great deal of leverage. You know, it was, oh yeah, well, of course, we, we would love to do these things and reverse Trump administration policy. But first you've got to take care of a small few things. What we've seen so far is that the Biden administration hasn't used that leverage effectively at all, not in Yemen, not in the United Nations at all, and not really with the Palestinians. They're about to have another sham election. Now, maybe they'll have it. Certainly it'll be a sham. They've already barred from participation a number of other viable candidates. And what, we're, what we want to see is the United States really holding the Palestinian feet to the fire on this, not for Israel, not as a favor to the Jewish community, not for anybody other than the Palestinian people themselves who deserve better governance, understanding that that better governance could possibly lead to peace. I see absolutely no indication in this administration that that mentality is 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 uh, you know is part of their thinking i think they're very much sort of old think about 
you know, the road to peace goes through Jerusalem slash Ramallah. And, you know, we have to have peace in the Middle East between the Israelis and the Palestinians before we can do anything. Uh, this, I think, was proven to be a lie over the last four years. But I think there are a lot of adherence to that sort of old school, grad school trope. And that's very worrying. Last point, I'm not going to talk about it. No, last two points. I'm not going to talk about it, but I hope you're going to ask me about it. Those are the return of the really bad guys who sucked us back into the Middle East, uh, even during the Obama and Trump administrations, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. They are absolutely back. They are much stronger than they were a few very short years ago. And last, what are the Russians and the Chinese up to? Again, no good. Gradations of no good, for sure. But worth talking about, worth thinking about, because even if we don't want to be in the Middle East, even if we don't want to do anything, they are there. And not to sound like an old school historian, but, you know, the great game is something they very much embrace. And we need to be very wary of how they use opportunities that are afforded to them by a weak American leadership, by an American leadership that wants to step back from the world. And I include Biden and Trump and Obama in that group. And that I think is very dangerous just going forward. I'm gonna stop blabbing and over to you guys. Thank you, Danielle, for that uh, fantastic start to today's webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, I did tell you that you were in for a treat and uh, we certainly haven't disappointed. Now, there was a lot in there. There's a lot to unpack. There's a lot of questions uh, that can be asked. So the way to do that is by using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen if you're using a laptop or a desktop, or if you're using a mobile device, you can hit the option button, which is three dots at the top of your mobile device, and you'll see a button button saying reactions. You can raise your hand through that. And then I will call upon you during the webinar to ask Danielle a question directly. So firstly, I would like to hand over to Ajax, Dr. Svee Fleischer. Hi, Danielle, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I want to ask a bit more about the Biden administration's RAN policy, which is that they're, or their declared policy is they're, as you said, going to return to the JCPO deal then tackle its shortcomings and other issues with Iranian behavior. Um, it's clear that they're not clear exactly, it's, there's some confusion, it seems like, about exactly how they're gonna try and do that. Uh, the Iranians are saying no. If you were advising Biden uh, about uh, to how to implement his declared policy in a way that's destructive rather than, uh, constructive rather than destructive, uh, what would you say to him? <laughs> I spend so much time sharing my unsolicited opinion about what the Biden administration should do on Iran. <laughs> I'm a little bit speechless. Most time I'm just stuffing it down their throats rather than being asked for it. Look, you know, the important thing for, the, for this administration to understand is that the mirror imaging that we've engaged in, and sorry to use a, a nerdy political science term, but you know, the mirror imaging that we engage in, in which we think about them as, as a normal government that, that looks at the challenges of the world the same way we do, I think has served us very ill as negotiators. So we don't understand, and I, I this is a pervasive problem, and it's not just a Republican Democrat problem, it's a problem within our analytical community, within our intelligence community as well. We, fail to understand what the domestic dynamics are inside Iran. What is actually going to prompt them to behave one way or another? And we have an unbelievably arrogant belief, I should say unsustained by absolutely any evidence of success on the ground, that we can manipulate Iran in order to advantage moderates over hardliners. First of all, this moderate hardliner thing is just unmitigated rubbish. Uh, and the reason I say that is not because there aren't people inside the Iranian regime who have different attitudes towards how to conduct the economy or how to have relations with the United States or whether we should be nice to France or not nice to France. No, th there's a full spectrum of views inside the regime, let alone inside the country, but inside the regime. Where there is no spectrum is on the nuclear program. Where there is no spectrum is on the, is on the support for Iran's proxies. Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, 
and I could go on and on uh, uh, with that list. And, and that is the problem. So when the United States assesses, when the Biden administration assesses how they can best move forward with containing an Iranian nuclear program that is a danger, what I would say is exactly what uh, Jim Jeffries, who was uh, until recently uh, the uh, special envoy inside the Trump administration, but a very experienced US ambassador who joined my podcast today, what the hell is going on, it's called. Um, he said, look, you know, the right way to think about this is the nuclear program is really important. It doesn't eclipse everything else. And so if you're going in, you need to think about the nuclear program and how to leverage what advantages we have, but you need to think about how it is that we can mitigate these other problems. Wendy Sherman, my beloved friend Wendy, is a big believer in the term sequencing. Okay, what does sequencing mean? No. I do this and you do that, and then I do this and you do that. She did that with the North Koreans in the, in the infamous six party talks in the 1990s when she was in the Clinton administration. And I don't know whether you guys have noticed, and this is one of my lines, so I'm sorry if I've uttered it before to you, but I don't know if you've noticed, North Korea still has a freaking nuclear weapons program. Right, because sequencing doesn't work. We don't have the gumption for it, they do. And if you are not willing to attack them on every track, you are not going to succeed on any track. And that's the advice that I would give them. But then again, everybody who watches Iran ought to know this. And the fact that they doesn't just shows how politics triumphs over the actual real world lessons that we should learn from how these governments behave. I'll try and answer a little more succinctly, but that was sort of a big, broad question. No, thank you. That was a fantastic answer. I'll hand over now to Anthony Cohen. Thank you, Daniel, for your very lucid uh, uh, talk. Um, I think that from what I've gathered, the Biden administration is going to use the uh, Kagoshi affair uh, with Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, a great deal. And no one's denying the fact that it was wrong and should be um, taken out. But compared to Iran, that's uh, child's play. They did that on a daily basis, you know, with uh, gays and, uh, uh, um, you know, any protesters, as does Mr. Putin, you know. You just got to have a look at uh, the record that almost shows up on a weekly basis, the number of protesters there that get shot and killed. So. You know, I think that the argument, while it might be valid uh, attacking Saudi Arabia on that, I have to remember that all these there are all these other actors in the game and that the Indian Ocean is going to be the trade ocean of the future and that they would be far wiser in uh, trying to uh, make good with uh, Saudi Arabia and those Gulf states than... Uh, countries that are trying to make it difficult for them. So I think you've made it, I mean, look, you make a very important point. Uh, and, and, and let me throw back at you what I just said, which is reality really doesn't intrude here. You know, the Khashoggi murder was, was, was criminal, <laughs> but to coin a phrase, it uh, wasn't just criminal, it was stupid. It was an unbelievably dumb thing to do. And I don't think that anybody, oh, can you bring me some more too? Um, and, and I don't think that, <laughs> this is what home life is like. Um, but I, I don't think that, that anybody wants to excuse Saudi Arabia for what happened. And I don't, I don't think that anybody who's intellectually honest um, is, it, it can, can really suggest that the record of, of Iran is, is somehow you know, better. Look at the look at those who they've killed this year alone. Uh, I don't need to go through the litany. You all you all know. Here's the the problem for all of us. Um, the problem is that there is now in America, and I don't want to speak to Australia, although I suspect it's happening in Australia as well. There is a, a consensus driven perspective 
that is vertically integrated between a political party, media, and accepted commentators. And because of that, you have this incredible emphasis on the Khashoggi murder. If I counted for you the number of articles that were in the Washington Post about this, you wouldn't believe it. Okay. If I recounted to you the number of times that, you know, an equivalent story was written about another country that was engaged in this sort of behavior, you wouldn't believe it. This is a narrative. It's taken hold. There are advertisements funded, I suspect, by Qatar on bus stops here about Khashoggi. There is a documentary that has been made about him. And the Saudis are not capable of managing this very intelligently. And the Democratic Party and the media establishment have decided that this is the story they're going to tell. We cannot discount that. We cannot discount it because it's part of our reality. And so the lesson, the correct lesson, is that the Saudis, first of all, and I've told you know their ambassador and 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 Mohammed bin Salman this to, to their faces, um, is that they have to be better than they ever were. And and that those who are hoping to, to move forward need to move forward more courageously than ever before. That happened to a certain extent in the Trump administration, but I'm worried now that the Saudis are gonna behave stupidly and petulantly in response to the Biden administration's own stupid and petulant behavior. Thank you for that. Now we'll hand over to Ajax Sharon Middleman. Thanks, Daniel. You mentioned the Biden administration's cold approach towards Saudi Arabia. Do you think that will impact the Abraham Accords? And do you think the Biden administration will still proactively pursue enhancing the Abraham Accords? Um, sorry, you broke up a little, Sharon, at the beginning, but um, but I'll answer if I didn't, and then let me know if I missed something. So I don't think that the uh, I don't think the Biden administration will undermine the Abraham Accords. Uh, look, uh, au contraire, they will validate for everybody who was involved the rationale for inking those accords in the first place, which is that there needs to be a de facto. Uh, anti-Iran alliance in the Middle East that exists separate from the vagaries of American politics, that basically Israel, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Egypt, and others can no longer depend on America, um, in some instances correctly, and in some instances very mistakenly. Um, they can no longer depend on America, and they need to stand together and do their utmost to confront this challenge in the hope that we will be standing behind them, but never with the 100% confidence. So I don't think they'll undermine it. I think they'll actually perhaps inadvertently do a lot to, to validate it. I also think that you know, they won't say it as publicly as perhaps we would like, but I think that a lot of people recognize that, uh, to, to use the vernacular, this is pretty cool. Yeah. It, because it was pretty cool, and uh, and so I hope that I hope I hope that they'll they'll stand by it. I do not believe that they will pursue more such agreements for exactly the reason I stated up front, which is that they're mired in this old thing about the Middle East that led to nothing but failure, but nonetheless has been extraordinarily popular among peace processors over these many years. Thank you, Danielle, for that. I'll now hand over to Ajax Aaron Shapiro. Yes, hi, Danielle. I, a very curious thing happened when the uh, White House press secretary, in a direct question, refused to term Israel an important ally. Now, uh, how should, what should be read into this? It's a very strange thing. Now, the question did include Saudi Arabia, so perhaps that the, it goes back to the Saudi Arabia issue, but I'll, I'll, I'd really love to hear your take on that. Right. Jen Psaki, uh, the White House spokes, uh, spokeswoman on that. Um, this is part of the pettiness that um, leads the president of the United States not to talk to the prime minister of Israel. Um, it, it's lamentable, truly lamentable. 
Um, what will it mean? At the end of the day, it won't mean it won't mean very much. It's just signaling, and the signaling is bad. Um, the signaling is we're not with you. The signaling is we don't like you. The signaling is it's not going to be business like it was in the last four years with your buddy Jared, and you know we don't like them. But at the end of the day, is it going to change the fundamentals of the relationship? I don't think so. I don't think so under Joe Biden, um, because he may not be all there all the time. But I do think that uh, I do think that there's a line that he will not cross. And he's been historically a member of Congress who was pro-Israel. He was never as hostile as Obama was to Israel. And he is the last of a generation of Democrats that I think will not turn on our friend Israel. Uh, Jen Psaki represents the different perspective on that. And I think the only question is, you know, how far will the rhetoric go and how much does it betray real policy? I think at a certain point, he's just going to kind of put his hand up and say, you know what, enough. Uh, at, at least I hope so. That's the man I know. Sounds like we're in for a bit of a, uh, a toing and froing and a bit of a roller coaster ride over the next four years. I'll now hand over to uh, Dr. Ran Porat. Hi, Danielle. Uh, so far, very interesting talk, and thank you for that. Uh, question about two uh, people that are in the uh, administration or, or said to be in the administration. One is the uh, shadow, long shadow of John Kerry, who's slated to be uh, uh, working on environment issues. And the other one, which I see as very important, I wanted to, to, to hear what you think his, his influence would be, is the appointment of uh, William Bill Burns to head the CIA, given uh, the uh, reported uh, cooperation between Israel and, and uh, US on various Middle Eastern uh, issues. What do you think the possible implication of these two people in the administration could be on the Middle East? Um, so, John Kerry, you know, I think if we held a little election in our group of, you know, 70 people here, um, we would not elect John Kerry to dog catcher. Uh, and um, the one thing that I think a lot of people fail to appreciate is that that's exactly the way his colleagues feel about him too. So he was one of the least popular members of the Senate you saw what happened when he ran for president. And I suspect that his meddling from his throne as climate czar will be unwelcome in other areas. Um, you yeah, know, call it an instinct, uh, but let's hope it's true. Uh, for Bill, you know, um, Bill is a former foreign service officer. He is. He was in. Um, he was in uh, the Bureau of Near East Affairs for many years. Um, if you remember, he was the one who negotiated with the Libyans over Pan Am 103. He's been around forever. Bill Burns is not. Is not anti-Israel. Bill Burns is old school, and I just talked about the problems of old school, but there are advantages to old school as well. I'd say that the modern Democratic Party, the, the, the new Gen X of Dem the Democratic Party is very anti-Israel. Bill is 67 years old um, and actually he may actually be 64 years old, um, but very great. <laughs> and, he, and, and, and he doesn't represent that generation at all. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that that's gonna have an impact on intelligence cooperation. There is an historic bias and an anti-Israel bias inside the CIA that has been there for many years and um, relates uh, in some ways to the merits of Israeli espionage against the United States and in some ways to a, 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 an historic anti-Israel um, uh, attitude that we can, we can trace back to the very early days of the CIA. But it's not going to mean a fundamental change in the relationship. I, I don't think Bill would oversee such a thing. And I am confident that he would, that he does not represent, you know, the AOC uh, squad school of hostility towards everything Israel does. Israel's intelligence community has earned a great deal of respect 
from uh, from our folks over the years, and I don't expect that to dissipate in any way. So good news. Thank you, Danielle. Now I'll go to uh, Colin to ask a question. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Joel. Uh, Danielle, you've written uh, uh, very persuasively uh, uh, that the Biden administration shouldn't have rejoined the UN Human Rights Council, which we all know is ridiculously biased against Israel. The next are useless when it comes to genuine human rights abuses, be it Iran, China, whoever. So what, if anything, uh, could the US do uh, to improve the UN Human Rights Council, given that it's coming back? and given that Australia is there as well. And if I can ask a double barrel one while we're on the UN's, uh, UNRWA. So as we know, the, the administration plans to resume funding of UNRWA as well. It's very problematic agency, as we all know, when it comes to uh, Palestinian refugees and indeed, you know, the best interests of the Palestinians going forward in a way, uh, given that they reinforce the old mantra. Uh, is there any way this funding could be used to help engineer, you know, reform of uh, UNRWA or at least minimise the obvious uh, negative impacts it has on any possible peace process going forward? So, a couple of things. The, the, first, the first question, the Human Rights Council. Uh, I'm uh, in the middle of a project with my colleague Brett Schaefer from the Heritage Foundation on United Nations reform and contrary to what some people might think we're actually really trying to sort of lay out what it is that some of these agencies could do to fulfill the mission uh, for which they were created you know the World Health Organization could become about world health and and uh, and the human rights council can become about human rights but that that's just a one-liner we've laid out a series of, of of reforms that we think will could change the way that um the way that that these organizations are governed part of the problem with the human rights council is it obsession with israel you know, we all know that uh, we all know that that Israel is governed by a single agenda item, a so-called agenda item within the Human Rights Council mandate, and then the entire rest of the world is governed by another agenda item. Uh, that's why Israel is disproportionately targeted. And all I can say about that is, first of all. I'm really disappointed the Biden administration squandered its leverage with the Human Rights Council not to make these demands, um, to, to make some changes about this. But that said, we are, uh, the Human Rights Council is up for a review sometime in the next couple of years. It's not, the date is not fixed. And the United States could actually begin to demand with the disproportionate amount that we pay into the Human Rights Council that the election process within the council changes. So for example, uh, most people don't know this uh, because it's unbelievably arcane and corrupt because shockingly that's how the UN works. But the various regional groups only nominate the number of countries that they know are going to win election. There's no real competition for election to the Human Rights Council. Also, countries that are under mandate for investigation in the council are not barred from membership in the council so they can basically be both sort of the, the chicken and the fox uh, in, in, in the council and that, that could change. Even those two tiny things could actually make some kind of a difference. Now, of course, they're not going to get the Human Rights Council to examine what it is that the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs just to pick a tiny example of millions of people in concentration camps in this day and age. But we could see some kind of reform in exchange for the vast sum of money that we fork over to them. Now, on the in the case of UNRWA, I have always looked to the Congress on this, and part of that is my congressional bias because I worked there and that's how we articulated foreign policy. We told people, oh, you want the money? Here's what you've got to do. And that really is the role that Congress needs to play. The problem is that Congress no longer plays its role in any sort of normal sense of the word. And so, you know, what, what we in America call regular order, which is how Congress used to do business, is the right way to go after UNRWA. What I hold out hope for actually is that 
while the United States goes back in, or the Arab funders who have been sustaining UNRWA and have been on the side sustaining the Palestinians decide that they don't want to do it anymore. So if you've noticed, for example, the United Arab Emirates cut their funding to UNRWA dramatically. I think that there's actually an Abraham Accord corollary for a whole series of things that could happen with the Palestinians that could be super interesting and that could provide the leverage for those who want to see reform, who, for those who want to see true, you know, a true future for the Palestinian people. And UNRWA is not going to be that way forward, but maybe UNRWA can become irrelevant. Maybe UNRWA can become the, the, the sideshow because there's not going to be any sustenance of any other kind. When you look to our friends in Canada and many in Europe, even they are getting sick and tired of the, of, uh, of the game that is UNRWA. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, that, that there'll be some sort of consensus that gels around this in the future, not guided by the Biden administration, or sadly, I'm afraid by the Congress, but perhaps led by the sort of new winds of, of alliances in the Middle East. We'll see. Now, just a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> we have time for some more questions. There's a reaction button at the bottom of your screen that you can click to raise your hand, or you can click the option button at the top of your screen if you're using a mobile device. I'll now hand over to Ajax Ovid Labelle. Danielle, thanks for doing this. Um, the Biden administration has been, at least rhetorically, very tough on Turkey and China so far, which is good. But what do you think uh, the actual policy is going to look like? And do you think the pivot Asia will finally happen? Look, I think that Turkey is one of the um, uh, disgraces of American foreign policy. And <sighs> That's not, that wasn't, contrary to popular wisdom, I don't think that was a Donald Trump problem. I think that was an America problem. We still haven't figured out what to do about Turkey. We don't, we don't know. Um, you know, Turkey is on the one hand a, a, a NATO ally. On the other hand, Erdogan has become the godfather of, of the Muslim Brotherhood. How do, you, how do you figure out what to do about this? How do you manage this? Oh, and of course, he's got all of those you know, pressure points by holding the spigot on refugees that pour into uh, the European Union. So he's got you know, like the likes of Angela Merkel by the throat. This is one of the weaknesses, the great weaknesses of, of NATO that I think doesn't get discussed enough. And... The reality is that I suspect that Biden won't be tougher on Erdogan than Trump was. Uh, if you look at their incursion into Iraq, if you look at what they've been doing in Syria, we've seen very little pushback from the United States. And um, I, I continue to believe that's because no one really knows what to do. Not at all. Now, what was the second part of Ed uh, of your of your question? Because you asked about Turkey, but I missed the second part because I was focusing on the bunk bed. Uh, China and the pivot to Asia, and yes, it is. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so, first of all, I can't believe you're the first one to ask me, and I can't believe that Colin didn't ask me about this. But um, you, you know. We've talked about we've talked about the the, the so-called pivot to Asia, unbelievably infelicitous expression uh, embraced by uh, by the Obama administration. And of course, what does the pivot mean? Well, what they really wanted it to mean was a pivot, right? What happens when you pivot? You turn your back on somebody else, and they wanted to turn their back on the Middle East. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for me, because I'll always be in business, is that the Middle East won't let you turn your back on them, and so. I think that the big question for us, other than the challenge that China represents, is also the challenge that China's going to represent in the Middle East. So um, I, I actually sat down with a, a group of my colleagues today at AEI, fortunately. Um, I brought together the Asia people and the Middle East people to talk about how real the China problem is in, in the region, because there's been a lot of sort of 
you know, beating of breasts and tearing of, 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 of whatever it is that one tears, um, garments. Uh, on the question of China, are they, you know, they, 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 they're in the Haifa port, they're doing business with Iran, now they're in Iraq, what's going to happen next? They're doing business with Saudi Arabia, the Belt and Road Initiative is such a fear. And the consensus among my colleagues who are no softies on this was that China in the Middle East is much less a question to worry about. Um, they will be uh, they will be looking for advantage, but they're not going to be looking to make a strategic commitment to the Middle East. Um, Israel's made a lot of mistakes on China, and for some reason that I can't understand, seems unwilling to wake up to that fact. Um, then again, perhaps Australia also shouldn't have rented out land next to the American Marine base uh, to the Chinese. So I guess our friends do sometimes make mistakes. But um, but overall, the consensus, and, and I listen very much to, to my colleagues, Dan Blumenthal and Derek Scissors on this. Overall, their view is that China is not willing to make either a financial or a strategic commitment to the Middle East, which is too screwed up and which they don't want to focus on. And that while they're very focused on ensuring energy supplies and the continuity of supply for themselves, they're not really interested in getting in the middle of the Iran fight with the United States or anything else. They'll, they'll, they'll pick up the, the, the pieces of the mess if they can and, and use them to their advantage, but not more than that. Will America be willing to pivot to Asia? Uh, you know, America, the world's richest, most powerful country, can't actually chew gum and walk. And uh, of course, even though we have 11 aircraft carriers and need 15 aircraft carriers, we only have two actual aircraft carriers in business at any given moment. And so our ability to focus on China and the South China Sea and a focus on the Mediterranean is not exactly guaranteed. I'm really looking forward to seeing how Lloyd Austin, who has declared that domestic terrorism and climate change are really important things for him to focus on, is going to deal with that. I don't know what the answer is. Um, I really don't. Thank you for that. I'll now hand over to Jeremy Samuel. Thanks very much. And thanks, Danielle. Um, I wanted to go back to domestic things in the US. Uh, Congress people, Ilhan and Cortez, uh, I think it's the, the troika of uh, very hard left, probably Muslim or certainly Islamic, Islama jihadi inclined people. Um, can you tell us uh, what role, if any, you, you see them playing in the current administration and, and uh, in the House and uh, and how you expect them to impact things uh, with respect to both Israel and the Jewish community, because uh, from a distance, they seem to be very worrying people. I think what most Democrats would say to you is that their, their, their power in the party is um, in no way proportionate to their voices. And uh, I don't know whether that's true. Um, you know, I don't want to pretend to any deep insight into, um, you know, in, into the internal machinations of the Democratic Party. But um, I'll say, I'll, I'll say this, Ayanna Presley, Ilhan Omar, um, uh, Rashta Tlaib, uh, uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, yeah, they're not my kind of girls. Um, and they're very, very hostile to, to Israel. The problem is that, yes, they're loudmouthed. Yes, they don't represent what, let's call it the mainstream of the Democratic Party represents. The problem is the Democratic Party has moved ever leftwards. And... There, the the part the, the the party still wants to elect a Joe Biden, but the elites and the decision makers are very mindful about what those guys, the squad, represents. Right, Chuck Schumer is worried about a challenge from AOC for his New York Senate seat. I don't know why he's even thinking of running again, but that's a different problem. 
And that's a, a, a big deal with, there are a whole series of forces coming together. One is the death of, of, of the generation that fought in World War II, the people who survived the Holocaust, um, the generation that looked at Israel as the underdog. Right? That generation is passing and a lot of the most vocal, most influential movements inside the left are very hostile, not just to Israel, but to Jews. And, you know, I can only recount to you, um, you know, everybody has their personal battles. Everybody has their own intergenerational issues inside their family, right? Um, uh, for those of you who know me, and I know a bunch of you, I've got three girls. Um, and uh, Sophie is my middle daughter. She's very engaged. She, you know, when 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 uh, the whole all of the all of the the, the terrible uh, things were happening uh, between uh, between the uh, black community in America and the police last summer, she was always posting on her Instagram about Black Lives Matter and about the police and about how we need to stand up. And I asked her, "So, have you looked at what Black Lives Matter stands for?" And she said, no. And I said, okay, why don't you go and read what they say about Zionism? And she did. And now she's still very sympathetic as she's young and, and she's idealistic and, and we could be a better country. But she posts about the attacks on Hillel's in universities, the attacks on Jewish students in universities. And the problem is she's on the losing side. Okay? We're on the losing side. That's where that generation is. And it's a very, very hard fight ahead. And I think that, um, I think that for those of us who live in America and, and who engage in this every day, it's become harder and harder to actually express yourself and hear your voice heard in defense of the things that you believe in, you know, which is, by the way, you know, against police brutality, but also for, you know, for democracy, for equal treatment, for respect for minorities, that includes respect for minorities which are Jews, <laughs> that includes respect for oppressed people, that includes respect for people who don't have a voice, which includes these communities. And that is a very hard argument to have here. And, um, smarter people than I uh, ha have, like Brett Stevens, have many thoughts on this. And all I can tell you is um, it's getting harder and harder to speak out. Thank you, Danielle, for that. Now I'll hand over to Ajax Jeremy Jones for the final question. Uh, thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, we've been looking uh, I won't say with horror, but with a great deal of concern at the decision of the International Criminal Court, a uh, pre chamber decision regarding a state of Palestine. We've seen the re reactions from America and there's the general question about the International Criminal Court and how America should relate to it, I have for you. But related to that also is there's been a great deal of talk from the Biden team, the Biden squad, about multilateralism, using others you know, being part of a team to solve problems, not acting alone. And asking from an Australian perspective, with the International Criminal Court, United Nations bodies, all of them, international bodies, where do you think the Biden administration sees countries, not just countries such as Australia, but specifically Australia as part of its team to solve some of the multilateral, global, international problems? So on the ICC, uh, you know, I asked my husband about this, who who uh, who worked a great deal on the ICC and on the Rome Statute, uh, because he's a he's a, a lawyer and a, a government lawyer. And you know, look, this is what the ICC has always been about. Um, I'm happy to see the back of Fatah bin Souda, um, and I'm hopeful that the new leadership, the new leadership at the ICC, will be a little more sensible. I'm also interested that um, the the Biden administration moved very quickly to lift the terrorism designation off the Houthis, but hasn't yet lifted the sanctions that the Trump administration imposed on the ICC. So I'm sure it'll come, but perhaps it'll come with a little pressure. 
you know, look, if the ICC's aim is to prosecute Americans um, and Israel and, um, and uh, the odd African leader, then all I can say is that worm is gonna turn. Uh, you know, we're going to have a, a Democratic Congress for the next two years, but then there's going to be a Republican Congress. And it would be a really big mistake to continue to overplay its hand because I think a lot of people, I think the Canadians, even under Justin Trudeau and others, are just getting sick and tired of this rubbish. Um, I hope I'm right. I, I hope that, that, um, that there'll be some wisdom brought to this. But, you know, we'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see. The Biden administration cannot countenance the prosecution of Americans. Let's forget about Israel and the Palestinian question for a second. If, in fact, the uh, ICC needs to overstep in that way, I think they're going to lose a lot of support in the United States. Um, and, and by the way, you know, for Israel, the best thing is to just remind people there, but for the grace of God, go you, because everybody can run afoul of these international, you know, keystone cops who arrogate to themselves powers, uh, which they were not afforded by any treaty anywhere. On Australia, um, you know, Australia is a vital, vital piece of any Asia strategy. We can't rely on the Philippines anymore. Uh, South Korea, frankly, is a little bit worrisome. Uh, and the United States has got to look to what the uh, the Chinese are up to and and cobble together the best kind of alliance it can. Uh, the Biden administration isn't going to revisit, unfortunately, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that we so stupidly walked away from. And I say stupidly, Trump and Hillary Clinton. And, um, and so our ties are not going to be richer for a trading arrangement that excludes China uh, and 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 establishes new rules of the road. I am when I look at who who is going to make up the dramatis personae of this administration. I'm very hopeful that the relationship with Australia will continue to be very good, and that America will continue to rely on Australia as a really important cornerstone of our Pacific strategy. Um, you know, I I I. I I don't see the kind of crazy that we have on the Middle East in our Asia strategy. And because of that, I'm really quite optimistic. So fingers crossed that we'll still be able to, we'll still be able to rely on our really good friends in Canberra for a better policy. Thank you so much for that, Danielle. And ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for tonight. Uh, another thank you on behalf of AJAC to our wonderful guest tonight, Danielle Pletka. It's great to have you back with us for 2021 and we look forward to remaining in touch with you throughout the next couple of months. As I said to you at the top of the hour, our next two webinars will be with Elliot Abrams on Tuesday, the 2nd of March and Ehud Yari on Wednesday, the 17th of March. Uh, invitation will be out shortly in the next couple of hours. As I said, that's all we have time for. It's been a pleasure hosting you today and we look forward to seeing you again soon.